Hello, everyone. Uh, Dr. John Santa Anna here. Hi, I'm Dr. Rob Farhat. So we're here uh, going to talk about the topic for tonight is um, uh, pain management procedures that we do and perform here at the uh, Michigan Center for Regenerative Medicine. The, so one of the reasons why I decided to have this conversation is because, as you guys know, that regenerative medicine procedures are not covered by insurance, but we still get a lot of patients that can benefit from these pain management procedures that can be beneficial for a lot of patients, right? Exactly. So there are what we what I term as traditional uh, pain management procedures. Most people have heard of them, epidural steroid injections, set injections, those kind of things. And we'll be reviewing some other advanced procedures too. Yeah. A lot of times we use these, these pain blockers, these procedures uh, as a diagnostic and a therapeutic procedure too, so that we can tell for sure where the issue is coming from. And insurances are pretty good in covering these procedures for a lot for a lot of patients. So uh, Dr. Farah, tell us a little bit more about your experience and your background in pain management. Sure. Uh, I did my um, physical medicine rehabilitation residency at the University of Michigan. And I also did a pain medicine fellowship, which is a one year additional training that focuses on the interventional aspects of pain medicine as well as all the other uh, treatment strategies that are available. Um, I eventually went to a, um, a practice with uh, multi-specialty, so uh, focus on spine mainly, but um, I've done procedures now for 15 years. Um, there has been some advancements in some of the uh, basic procedures, but um, just like uh, Dr. Santa Ana said, most of what we do is mainly a diagnostic procedure to see if it's a pain source um, is appropriate and then try to treat it definitively. Um, but um, nowadays things are a little restrictive from the insurance standpoint. Um, we have to be very specific with the options that we give patients. Uh, sometimes we have to jump through some hoops, especially if it's the first time somebody's had an episode of uh, back or neck or knee or something like that, um, pain. Um, so we usually have to start with the most conservative approach, which is rest, anti-inflammatories, uh, physical therapy for a few weeks, and then before we can even order an imaging study. So it's nice if um, people come to us already have those things completed mm -hmm. uh, so that we can actually look at some of the procedures that um, may benefit patients in the long run. Yeah. And then, yeah, just to echo uh, Dr. Farhat here. So the because of our background in physical medicine and pain management, we can treat everything from head to toe in regards to pain, right? We can't, we don't just focus on your lower back or your shoulder or your knee. A lot of times, just, a lot of these conditions are, are tied all together. So we kind of look at how they all work and function together and how that contributes to your, your dysfunction and your ability to do certain things. So just having that experience of treating multiple areas uh, gives us an advantage. And like you mentioned too, with having the imaging on hand, it just kind of helps us speed up the process because other than the physical examination that we do in the office, having imaging there too kind of gives us a little peek of kind of what's going on internally and when we plan these procedures it helps so it can be up kind of jump a few steps in the, in the treatment where did you do your fellowship so i i, I did my uh, fellowship at uh, michigan neurology it's uh, my first place that we had a, um, a my first job outside of the military so it's a, a interventional spine and sports fellowship where i did more of the advanced procedures as well and just over time just kind of built on from there and just kind of started doing more procedures and uh, and kind of as the field advances, just kind of kept up to date with all those things. Yeah, like I didn't, uh, during my fellowship, I actually did not learn spinal cord stimulation. It's very bread and butter um, yeah. procedures. And I think it's true for, for most, right? You kind of learn like a nice foundation and yeah. training. And then as you go through your practice and you start molding how your practice is going to be, that's, that's, that's how kind of things progress from there. Um, all right. So that sounds good. So let's, let's talk about these kind of bread and butter procedures that that you know a lot of pain physicians do, right? So you have your epidural injections, your uh, your your nerve block injections, and joint injections. The how, how would you when a patient comes in? How what's a good candidate for these types of procedures? Let's say for an epidural. So for epidural steroid injections, we're looking at somebody that has 
both a combination of, uh, let's say we start with the low back, low back pain and also symptoms of leg pain, which means usually there's a pinch nerve of some type. Um, and again, I go back to this insurance thing because there, there's stickler. So um, patients that just have back pain sometimes don't even qualify for an epidural steroid injection. They have to have this pinch nerve either down their leg or if it's their neck in their arm. So that is usually the indication. And again, have to go through some short-term uh, conservative management. And if that doesn't work, then we're looking at doing these injections. Uh, epidural steroid injections are typically, just like it sounds, it's a, it's a steroid or sometimes we call it cortisone, uh, but it's a medication that is injected directly into the area that is causing the pinching of the nerve to try to bathe the area, the nerves specifically with this cortisone to calm down the inflammatory process. We try to do, if we can, uh, two injections over a short time frame to see if we can maximize the improvement. But again, um, it depends on the response to the first injection. Um, there's a couple different approaches uh, uh, to get the medication in the spine, but it's all done under visualization. So we use this machine behind us, this fluoroscopy, which is a live x-ray machine. Um, usually we have to inject a dye to verify the position and then the cocktail of medication which includes the cortisone. Yeah. And then I think the standard of care now is doing it all under image guidance. I remember back then, a few years ago, that wasn't the standard of care and you have physicians practicing doing these spinal injections without any imaging. So um, you have to be tremendously lucky to, to do that. But now standard of care is, has to be with, with imaging. And we carry that same belief with any other injections that we do. So um, spines or joints, we always use image guidance, whether it's with the x-ray or with the ultrasound kind of helps us be able to kind of evaluate these things. And, and the, the way that I like using these steroid injections is that, you know, the steroids is good at relieving the pain and the inflammation. So it's a good way to kind of pinpoint these areas for somebody who has, let's say, uh, like a, a, a acute pain or exacerbation of a pain. It's a really good treatment to do because it gets to the source of the pain and treats it. A lot of times he just needs that one shot in the right location to get you good relief. And then you can go to physical therapy and do all these other treatments that's gonna be hopefully more long-term and relieving your symptoms. Right. And we know that long-term corticosteroid exposure is not great, it's not a good, we have all heard about these side effects, which which we totally understand and we always take that into consideration. So um, we usually use it in an acute setting. So if somebody has a new onset or a flare up that they may have had in the past, it comes back but repetitively doing the injection, the cortisone injections is usually not a good idea. Um, it has a long-term um, systemic effects that can uh, affect how your metabolism, your hormone response, um, even if it's in a uh, confined space, there's deterioration of the area. So uh, it's good to do it when you need it a few times a year at most, but beyond that, usually it's not recommended more than that. Yep. So, the, so that's for the joint injections. Uh, next one we want to talk about is something called radiofrequency ablation. Um, why don't right. you start off with that? So usually we, the idea of the radiofrequency ablation is to give somebody longer term results. Um, most of what we do is in the spine. There is an indication now for the knee as well. But the idea is that we uh, ablate or um, eliminate the nerves that supply the area with information in order to distort the information going back to the brain. So uh, we usually do a test shot. If, they, if the patient responds to a test shot, then we do this ablation to try to give the response that they had from the test for months at a time, hopefully six months minimum or longer. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of patients call this burning the nerves, right? Because right. it's uh, with the radio frequency ablation, we do use temperature or heat to, in a way, kind of denature the, the sheath of the nerve and it essentially causes a nerve block in that area. And like Dr. Farhat says, it could give you six months to a year of relief. So for a lot of patients, that's a really welcome treatment because if the option is, you know, deal with it or um, surgery or get an injection or a disablation once a year, usually once a year, minimal invasive injections would, would trump over those other options. So it's a, it's a nice uh, treatment to add on to, but again, there's rules that we have to follow with insurances. 
Uh, so the, like what he alluded to, we have to do these test blocks to see if it's going to work and we have to be able to document all that stuff. So it's a process, but the end goal is, is, is effective if it's something that we can get to. Um, now moving on to uh, other advanced treatments that we do. So one of the things that uh, we like doing here is uh, the spinal cord stimulation or neurostimulation. So with the spinal cord stimulator, simulator, uh, the idea is it's an implantable device uh, that we put into your spine for, for somebody who has persistent back pain with pins and needles sensations or somebody who's had prior fusions or surgeries before in the neck or the lower back and continues to have symptoms of that pinched nerve and even patients who are diabetics and continue to have persistent nerve pain burning in the feet all the time, the spinal cord stimulator or nerve stimulator is a really, really good option for that. The other beauty about the stimulator is that we we do a trial of it first. So with the trial, we we do the procedure as an outpatient. It takes us about you know 45 minutes or an hour to do. You go home the same day, and you essentially take this device home on a test drive for about a week. So you essentially you live your life, you go to work, you take care of your kids, and after seven days, you come back, and then we take out the device, and you essentially tell us how well it worked. If it gave you significant pain relief, then that's the only time that we would do a permanent procedure where we implant and embed everything under your skin versus you coming back and telling us it wasn't that effective. Then at that point, we just take out the device and then we don't move forward with the implant. Right. So um, the way it works are these wires essentially lay along your spinal cord to disrupt the signal of pain that's going from the body to the brain. So during the trial, these wires lay on your spinal canal and then the battery's on the outside. So you have control of it. You can turn it off, you can turn it on, you get a battery control device that uh, increases the stimulation, decreases the stimulation. You talk to the representative from the company every day to monitor how you're feeling. Now, it'd be great if every one of them help the patient, right? But that's why we do the trial first. It's it's one of those things in medicine, very rare that you get to try it before you buy it. Um, so sometimes, and we've done this in the past for folks, like say they're looking at a major back surgery, um, which requires multiple levels of fusion, months of recovery, et cetera. So we may decide to do a spinal cord simulated trial to see if that gives them relief instead of having to go through an operation. Or on the other side is unfortunately they had the operation and it didn't help or they're still in pain or they're still on opioids or whatever the case may be. So we have an option for folks. And and Dr. Santana mentioned the neuropathy. So that's a new indication, a peripheral neuropathy. Unfortunately, there isn't a lot of solutions. There aren't a lot of solutions for folks that have peripheral neuropathy. Once the nerve is injured, it doesn't really come back. So they're stuck with persistent symptoms and the options we have for treatment neuropathy or medication management, live with it. But now we have the stimulator as an option. So um, diabetic peripheral neuropathy is the main neuropathy, but we can use it for any neuropathy. Uh, same idea. We put the stimulator in the spinal canal, stays there for a week, battery on the outside, and you get to feel what it's like. And uh, like John said, it comes out either way after a week. It has to come out because of concern for long-term infection. Um, but, and there are different products out there. So yeah. there are, I think, half a dozen um, companies now that offer some type of stimulator. Most of these companies actually do, they do other sort of ne- neural stimulation. Either they do pacemakers or defibrillator, some type of device that is already implanted. They just change the technology and we put it in a different place in the body. Mm-hmm. So um, there are some options for folks And there are some terrible conditions that really have no treatment, something called complex regional pain syndrome, or what you see called RSD, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, that really, there is not really a treatment for that other than uh, chronic medication um, or this device, so. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, one of these things too, like once it's implanted in you, because there is a device rep that kind of you're in communication with the whole time, the whole time this device is in you, that if your pain changes or your pain evolves differently from when you had it. There are these these updates in these programs that they can do, so they can keep making these adjustments until they find the right treatment and, and the pain relief that you need 
to to take care of this pain. The the, the best patient I had with a stimulator, she she's very curious about the device and how it works. That she's always in contact with the with the rep and and to the point that she has I think over twenty five programs in her handheld, so she can has a different you know pain reliever uh, uh, program for for every occasion. So that that's helpful too. And what's nice too is that you have a, somebody you can always contact, right? So let's yeah. say. Unfortunately, the doctor is not available, or the, the clinic is not available. Well, the rep is available if, if needed. So, um, and again, it's if it's implanted, it can be turned off. So, if there was something wrong, you, you have the option of just turning it off, and um, we can re investigate the device if needed. But um, it's actually an option that most people don't even know is out there. Yeah. I think the next evolution of that is the we, there's a peripheral nerve stimulator also for so for more specific nerve issues or more specific pain like a pain in the knee or a pain in the ankle or the foot either from surgery or from degeneration or something like that or even the shoulder pain from a prior surgery or, or from an injury we we have these peripheral nerve stimulators that work very similar to spinal cord stimulators but they go on very specific nerves that give sensation to different parts like your shoulders, your knees, your ankles, or anywhere else. It's the uh, it's same principle. We put the device along the nerve this time that gives sensation to that area. You go to a trial, peri a trial period again for about five to seven days. And then same idea, if it gives you really relief, then we put the implant. If, if not, then we don't move forward with it. So it's another option. And again, it's, it's, uh, it's a nice addition to the armament of somebody who's doing pain management to kind of have these non-opioid, non-pharmacological based treatments. Yeah, and so the, uh, some questions we normally get are, you know, is the battery, what's the, the deal with the battery? Well, like, if, does it go off when I'm at the airport or can I get an MRI? So um, there's always a, you have information in your wallet if you go traveling and go through the airport. People like have pacemakers, the same concept. MRIs, most devices these days are MRI compatible. It does require a certain MRI that maybe doesn't have the strength of um, the most advanced technological devices, but um, nowadays pretty much all the companies have uh, MRI compatible devices. Yes. And another good question too, a patient asked me, can I go swimming with it? Right, right. So yes, you can. As long as the, the wound is healed, the pocket is sealed, and your skin is healed over it, then yeah, it's uh, the idea is it's supposed to work invisibly, right? So you go through your your life, do all, enjoy everything you need to do, go to work, and it's just working in the background to block your pain. Okay. All right. So the next uh, discussion would be um, uh, a more invasive. So let's talk about more invasive type procedures from there. Um, the one of the options that we have for let's say um, like a herniated disc or an annular tear. Um, one of the things that that we found is the percutaneous um, discectomies. So from the term, the word means it's a an image guided procedure where we actually go into the disc to to repair the herniation. So we do that in two ways. So we use image guidance. We guide a um, a, a small capturing device that drive it to the disc uh, through a small needle. And the idea is we create a small um, um, cavity into the disc, essentially creating a vacuum in there that's going to shrink the disc together. And then afterwards, we kind of heat up the surface of the disc also to kind of close it off. So it's a really good treatment for patients who have what we call discogenic pain. So somebody who has pain in the lower back, not necessarily traveling down the legs, but very persistent pain on there. There's some tests that we could do to kind of stimulate that disc. But for, for, for the most part, for the right patient with this condition, uh, percutaneous discectomy is a minimally invasive surgical procedure that we could do um, on this an outpatient basis um, and, and works really well for those for those folks. Uh, like John said, it's a percutaneous procedure. So people have heard of a scope for their shoulder or their knee. It's the same idea. It's an endoscope. So you actually put a camera down into the uh, disc itself and it try to debulk the disc. So you sort of remove some of the material from the disc to try to either shrink a herniation that may be there or to stimulate this healing process that the body normally does. Again, there are lots of restrictions from an insurance standpoint. It has to, if the disc is herniated, it can't be bigger than a certain uh, amount that it's compressing a nerve. 
Um, again, it's insurance restricted and all these different things. But again, it's another option uh, that is available for folks. Um, we also can potentially do some of the regenerative treatment with this procedure. So let's say you get a deep bulking of your disc and you want to put some healing uh, autologous, either bone marrow or PRP into the area. Um, that would be done too, but it can be a different um, cost. The insurance will only pay for this endoscopic discectomy. It has to be done in a surgical center. Um, so there are, again, some restrictions, but these are options we can always look at. It, again, depends on what is the uh, cause of the pain, what segment is it, uh, those things. And did you not respond to these more conservative treatments, right. et cetera? Uh, so, there are some treatments out there that maybe the average person doesn't know about, or even the average uh, non-specialist yeah. uh, doesn't realize. So, yeah. And then uh, the other thing we want to talk about is uh, the spinal uh, sacral iliac joint fusion. So that's something that's one of the newer procedures that's kind of came about, yeah. um, and it's a it's a novel idea. So the idea with your SI joint. So the SI joint is this area in your body, which is kind of below your lumbar spine. It's where it's a joint where your, your pelvis actually meets your spine. It's a very common area of pain. It's one of these things that can be difficult to diagnose because it mimics a lot of the symptoms of low back pain. And typically a lot of times it's, it takes like an acute clinician to be able to diagnose it correctly, or it kind of happens through a process of elimination, right? So, right, statistically speaking, so the average person has a 20% chance of this sacroiliac joint being the cause of their symptoms. But there's a lot of referral patterns that Dr. Santana was mentioning. It's more likely this is a problem when people have already had, again, a lumbar fusion. And this, this joint where the pelvis and the tailbone articulate with one another, it's the only thing that's able to move anymore. So this becomes hypermobile and that causes pain. People can do cortisone shots in the joint to give them temporary relief, but let's say it doesn't last very long. So what are our options then? So we do have this radio frequency uh, ablation as an option, but that only gets half the joint. The joint is innervated by two separate nerves, nerve bundles. So one in the front, one in the back. The radio frequency only addresses the back. So again, test shot works great, but if it doesn't, the other option is this SI joint fusion, which essentially just like it sounds, fusing the two segments together. Uh, again, that has to be done in a surgical procedure. Once again, we have to confirm that's the source of the pain, so with diagnostic block or previous injections that have given short-term results, et cetera. Uh, it can either be done by um, an actual surgeon or now uh, pain specialists are able to do it uh, with the new technology that's out. It makes it a little bit uh, easier where you don't have to be uh, completely put to sleep or go to a hospital to have it done. So um, again, these options are out there for folks that yep. maybe don't know uh, what is available. Yeah, and then just to know, this is just kind of new that I just learned too. Uh, some insurers will allow SI joint fusions in the office now. Too. Oh, so really? that's, uh, that's, that's gonna be a big game changer too in the field. And uh, um, the, uh, what do you call this? So the, the other treatment that we could do other than SI joint fusion is you can actually put a stimulator there too. So there's two the two nerves that Dr. Farha was alluding the to, nerve. the clunial nerves, the superior and the medial clunial nerves. We can put a stimulator there too. So there's there's a lot of options to treat for pain, and and you know it's it's not just knowing the diagnosis, having the right diagnosis, knowing the anatomy, but also having experienced clinicians to be able to give you all of these options available that that's covered by insurance, that needs some work to get covered by insurance, and the ones that are not covered by insurance, like the regenerative medicine procedures, and having that experience really um, benefits a lot of our patients because you have this, this whole treatment algorithm option that you can use. I think half the issue that we do, I think at least the, that I know I do, is we're trying to figure out where the pain is coming yeah. from, right? Like, so that's half the battle. Is it your neck, is it your shoulder, or is it some other issue? So. Um, that's probably most of what we try to do is try to figure out where the pain is coming from. Yeah, and uh, and, and we all work collaboratively too. So I, yeah. many times I would ask Dr. Fry, hey, I got this really interesting case. Have you seen something like this? Or Dr. Navity. Uh, and then more often than not, one of us has seen it or, or knows something about it. And then it kind of creates this nice kind of environment where we all work together for helping our patients. 
All right. So, yeah. So the, let's go to some questions now. Uh, this question is from Joellen. Uh, do you have any effective treatments for someone suffering with lymphedema of the upper leg? Uh, so that's an interesting question. Yeah. So um, the question becomes, is it the pain from the lymphedema or is it actual the lymphedema, like trying to get the swelling down? Because lymphedema is a challenging thing to treat because um, the whole lymphatic system and the vascular issue. It's more of a vascular issue. So um, that's a tough question. We'd have to see if there is an option. If the spinal cord stimulator, if it's pain from the swelling of it. But as far as like getting the swelling gone, I don't I don't know if we have anything for that. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. It's just a tough one, right? Because there's multiple, again, the I think the whole idea with pain management is getting to the root cause of the problem and treating that. Whether we block it, or we put an anti-inflammatory, or we treat it with regenerative procedure. Lymphedema is tough because it's usually it's not one thing. It's usually caused by a series of things that kind of led to the lymphedema. Uh, but that's something that you know, if you want us to take a look, we more than happy to explore it here in the clinic. But um, just to be upfront, it's going to be a really difficult yeah, thing. Yeah, it's challenging. Right? Yeah. Um, but that's about it. So just kind of prelude. The reason why we kind of do this uh, talk today is because we know that pain is one of these more difficult things that patients have to deal with. So I think the the take home message is that you know we we might not have all the answers for you, but we can give you options of kind of how to treat treat it. Whether it's something that your insurance will cover or something that's on the regenerative medicine side, we have experience working with insurances also, so we know the ways to kind of get it appropriately approved by insurances. Um, and then the, so the first step in kind of getting this done is, is calling us here and setting, setting up an appointment. Yes, please. So uh, if you have a, any other questions, you can uh, give us a call here. The number is 248-216-1008. And we're the Michigan Center for General Medicine. We'd love to see you. And again, thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Good night. Good night.